Shalom. Welcome to the Messianic Hour with Rabbi Scott Sekulow. The Messianic Hour is a program designed to give you insight into the Jewish roots of your faith. Rabbi Scott is also here to answer your questions and help you gain a deeper understanding of Bible prophecy. And now, here's your host, Rabbi Scott Sekulow. Shalom and welcome to another edition of the Messianic Hour. I'm your host, Rabbi Scott. The show is dedicated to reaching the lost and educating the found. We're glad you're with us this week. I'm here with my wife, Judy, as we share from both a Jewish and Gentile perspective the meaning and understanding of the roots of our faith. And we're going to be looking, this will be a very special show. If you missed last week's, I encourage you to go to our website, rabbiscott.com, uh, or go to our YouTube site, The Messianic Hour, and listen or watch what was taking place, what we talked about. We're, we're looking at the Passover Seder, how to celebrate Passover in your home, and how to do it from a Jewish, a Messianic perspective, from uh, understanding the traditions and what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how they point to our Messiah. This was the last thing he did while he was on earth. This is very important, and as we're going to see, we have an understanding of what's going on and why we should do it. So I really want to encourage you, if you've never celebrated Passover before at your house, this is a great time to do it. It's coming up in the first week of April. Uh, it's Friday, April the, I want to say April the 6th, isn't that? Six or seven. Six or seven. I'll look check. on the calendar. <laughs> you check while I talk. I'll check. And uh, w- you always start it the night before at sunset, it's so it's on the 6th that evening. And it's a great way of really understanding the Jewish roots of your faith. If you want, you can go to our website, RabbiScott.com. You can order our Passover Haggadahs. And there are Messianic Haggadah that shows you how to celebrate the Passover. Again, right there at RabbiScott.com for more information on that. So we're going to be looking at the rest of how to celebrate Passover at your house. But if you missed last week, go check that out on our uh, radio, our internet site, or on YouTube as well. And, you know, Judy, there's a lot going on in the world right now. Lots going on in the Middle East. And people always. Ha- oh, wait, yes, it's always going. That's one thing. I hear people say, oh, I'll go over there when it's safe. Well, then you'll be going over there when the Messiah returns because there's always something going on there. Uh, this time is no different. But we do see a, a very big concern with the situation going on in Iran. And even this week with now uh, Russia sending troops into Syria to help the Syrian army. This is a concern on what's going on. And Russia, I think, is going to play a very important role in the Middle East in these next coming months now that uh, Putin is back in office, very interesting what could take place. And it, again, it says that um, in Scripture that the Lord will set watchmen on the walls, and that's what we need to be. We need to be those, even if we can't be there physically, right. we need to be here praying for Israel, be those watchmen, cover her and her leaders in prayer. It's very important. And you know, the Scripture tells us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, and we need to do that for this reason, for its protection, for its understanding. And while the world might, you know, things might be happening in the world, we know that God's in control and prayer does change things. So the U.S. really needs to uh, put pressure on Iran to stop the, the work that they're doing and to really keep a focus in on what's happening. But the seasons go on, and that's what we're going to be looking at for the rest of this show. So I want you to, again, Tune in to the Messianic Hour. You can, if you want to rehear this show again or hear last week's, go to rabbiscott.com or YouTube for more information. When we come back, we're going to be looking at Passover and how you, as a believer, can celebrate it. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Messianic Hour. I'm glad you're with us today. And we're going to be talking about Passover, continuing this week. Last week we talked kind of about the, the practical things that you need to do to get ready for Passover. And it is something that you do want to prepare for. You, you know, if you're just starting out, don't feel like you have to do everything. But you do have to go find your matzah and things like that. Sometimes, it, depending upon where you live, it's funny. Where we are, certain parts of the town, you are not going to find any That's matzah. Right. Other parts of the town, it's very prolific. So you want to be able to plan and pick up your matzah, pick up the supplies that you're going to need. Make it, if you're just starting out, make it easy. But we encourage you to really celebrate Passover. So, Rabbi, you left them with a little teaser yes, I did. last week that was kind of mean about you. You had to, you made them <laughs> wonder for a week. So why don't you get started and maybe sure, well, we you'll were, tell them. You know, it's funny because last night I was looking for some stuff and I actually found a box of matzah 
from last year. Now, I opened it up. It tastes the same as last year. If I had opened up five years from now, it would taste the same. <laughs> but that's matzo. Cardboard doesn't, doesn't change too much. No, but much. actually, it tastes really good. We, we make fun of it, but I love it. I eat matzo all year round, and uh, it, it actually is pretty good. So we might make fun of it, but it's fun. But we were talking, Judy, last time about the four questions. So I want to go over those again because the last question was changed in the year 70 A.D. Mm -hmm. So the questions, and this is what really tells the story of Passover. And the rest of the, the Seder is really retelling the story and understanding it. Again, if you missed last week, go to our website. But also, I forgot to mention, Judy, two weeks ago you did a great teaching <laughs> on how to prepare for the Passover in the house and what you need to do from our at our congregation. And that's on our website as well. Um, and we, can we need, uh, I'm, a, I'm telling Kim, our, our video producer, we need to put that on the website, a link so people can go right to it. And also, last week in a teaching, I did a really in-depth study on what we're doing here as well. So I encourage you to go there if you want to learn more about it, and you'll have all that information. But right now, we're going to look at um, the four questions, or the fair kashas. And the first question, it's, and this is how it's read. It's always traditionally done by the, the youngest in the house. And it says, why is the night of Passover different from all other nights of the year? On all other nights, we eat either leavened bread or matzah. But on this night, we eat only matzah. On all other nights, we eat all kinds of vegetables, but on this night, we eat only mora. On all other nights, we do not dip our vegetable even once, but on this night, we dip them twice. And here's the last question. Again, this one was changed in the year 70 AD, and it says, On all other nights, we eat, our me our, our, we eat either sitting or reclining, but on this night, we eat reclining. Now, the question that used to say before here dealt with the eating of the lamb. It used to say, on all other nights, we eat our meat raw, roasted, or broiled. But on this night, why do we eat it only roasted? And the answer was because you would uh, roast the lamb as a sacrifice uh, for Passover, for the forgiveness of our sins, and for remembrance of God taking us out of Egypt. But with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you could no longer do sacrifices, and therefore that question had to be changed and we see that this question was added in its place. An interesting note, this was a scripture that when, Judy, you would always, uh, you know, when we got married, I was not a believer. And every Sunday you would go to church and I would go to the temple and I was actually a teacher there. And uh, this time of year, spring break, we I didn't have to go. And you've always been great about going and uh, celebrating all the feasts and doing all this. And you asked me to come to a service and I really felt I couldn't say no because you've been so gracious about even trying to eat kafilta fish. i got to give you credit on that. Once. Once. But you Once. tried it. That was it. That was enough. Once. And I went there, and the pastor happened to be, it was it, they were doing communion that day. It would, but he spoke about this scripture, and he says that Yeshua, uh, there he said, Jesus was reclining at the table. And to be honest with you, I can't remember the rest of his message. But that was what started me on a quest for learning about this because I realized he was doing something very Jewish. And, you know, we're always taught, you know, raised Jewish that, you know, Jesus was uh, a, a good Christian and he was born on Christmas Lane and, you know, his parents were Mr. and Miss Christ. And uh, this idea that he was Jewish was really a new concept. And this really got me on the journey of following. So this is a very important scripture to me. So now what we're going to do is look at the different scriptures and, and how we answer those questions. And again, as we said before, the Passover Seder is really supposed to be an educational tool. And these four questions really kind of serve as the tool of making a child wonder, well, why do we do this? Right. And through the answering of these questions, we're able to educate our children, we're able to have our children participate, and it actually helps them learn. That's exactly right. And there are sections that they'll be able to read, and we encourage everyone to go and you know they'll read along. You really need to get, if you really want to celebrate Passover, you need to get a Passover Haggadah. And I really would suggest a Messianic one. There's a lot of good ones out there. We have one on our website. Judy and I put it together. Um, you can get it right through our website, rabbiscott.com. Uh, Jonathan Burnus with Jewish Voice Ministries has a great one. There's a lot of good ones out there, so but get one that's messianic so you really have an understanding. Now it does a little more teaching than some of the others, but you really get an understanding of what's going on here. 
and that's what we see. So, Judy, the, the rest of this, uh, what we're now doing is answering those questions. And, of course, the matzah, why did they make it the way they did? Well, it's made that way to represent Isaiah 53. He'll be pierced for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, it's interesting to note there's two types of matzah. There's a square matzah, which we traditionally see, and that's called machine-made matzah. And then you'll see also some places they'll have round rot matzah, and that is actually hand-made matzah. Um, and it's you know done in very similar ways, which is one's done by machine, one's done by hand. And the matzah, though, represents... Isaiah 53. It's a beautiful picture of how it all comes together. And you can see in the matzah, because they have to keep it flat, they have to pierce it. It makes stripes on it. Uh, the areas that bubble up look bruised. So you really get a great picture of our Messiah. And that's the prophetic side of matzah, Isaiah 53, and relating right. to Messi Messiah. The practical side of matzah is because we know when the Jewish people had to leave Egypt, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. Right. So they, in effect, made matzah. And we eat that in commemoration also. Right, because remember, Passover is only for one day. The Feast of Unleavened Bread is for seven days, and we celebrate them together as one starts on the night of the 14th, which immediately becomes the 15th, which is when Passover begins. Mm -hmm. Judy, one thing we always do is we want to tell about the ten plagues. Right. The ten plagues represents the deities of the Egyptians. There were literally thousands of Egyptian gods, but they fell into these ten major categories, and so what we see here is God is showing that he is God over all the false gods. And, you know, there's a great teach. If you, again, go to our website, you can hear last week's teaching because mm -hmm. I show how Moses deals with um, how it, they looked at him as a deity. Uh, that the was Egyptian the, the people Egyptians did. wanted to and how God uh, used that in different ways. So, again, go to our website for more on that. We only have a limited amount of time here that we can go in. But the ten plagues... The first one is the water turns to blood. Now think about it. If you were Pharaoh, now remember, God says hard is the heart of Pharaoh. Why does he do this? He hardens the heart to show that he's going to be God over all these false gods. So, I mean, if I was Pharaoh, after when I see the water turn to blood, they're out of here. Interesting note, and this is something you'll learn by going to our website. Pharaoh was considered the god of the Nile. He even said that he created the Nile. So the fact that this water, the Nile turns to blood, is really God saying, we are at, I am at war with you. I am taking a stand. So we see that go into place. We have blood, frogs, lice, uh, swarms, or, or um, what would that be? Uh, uh, swarms would be like bugs and stuff. Uh, livestock uh, disease, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, and then death of the firstborn. Now, something interesting to note here is some of these happen to everyone. But then it gets to the point where it only affects the Egyptians, that being the uh, locusts. Locusts, which will normally come in and eat everything, they eat all of the Egyptians, but where the Israelites are, uh, they don't bother it. Same thing with darkness. Darkness is throughout the land, except where the Israelites are. Where they are, there is light. Yeshua is the light of the world. We see a lot of great pictures that point to our Messiah. Another thing, the last one, death of the firstborn male. This happens not only to the male, but also to the livestock as well. Anything that, that was anything the firstborn. that was related to that person, unless you put blood over the doorpost. Even a Gentile could put blood over the door. They said, "Yes, I believe that God is God." If they had had enough by then and yes, had been broken, and many of them did, they they did that, and their lives were spared because God He basically covered it. He covered our sins. Death could not come after us. So we see here a beautiful picture of how these plagues come together. And then now the, the, the Pharaoh's heart is loosened and he sends the people out. But when they leave, they don't just leave empty handed. Here's the interesting thing. They leave with silver and gold, just like it was prophesied by Ab to Abraham that our ancestors would be gone, go to a foreign land. They'd be enslaved for 400 years. God will hear their cries, and when he sends them out, he will send them out with silver and gold. This is exactly what happens, but Judy, here's the interesting thing. What? They had silver and gold, but no weapons. And this is where it's going to get really interesting as they get ready to go into the wilderness, and right when we come back from the break, we're going to be looking at that as we tell more about the Passover. Those, those teasers, you got to have it. Check it out at RabbiScott.com. Remember, if you want to bless Israel, you can plant trees in the land through our website. We are a listener-supported show. Sign up for our newsletters as well, as you can 
Uh, get a free book, I Have a Friend Who's Jewish to You, all right at rabbiscott.com. We'll be back right after this. <laughs> 